Ooh, new podcast with the podcast king. The podcast king. The guy that changed the game in podcasting. He was all our inspirations. And, you know, I, I love this podcast because I asked him a question that was really fascinating to me. Is how does he come up with his ideas? Because he can take a stance on something and then he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't waver at all. I, I, I find that admirable. I don't like taking stances on a ton of stuff because I waver like a fucking sail that no one has a hold of the rope. Like I'm just whap, whap, whap. but he's so smart. He's the, I mean, he's the guy that did moved over from radio. I'm, I feel lucky to consider him a, I mean, I say a friend, I don't know if he'd let me spend the night at his house, but I've had cool conversations with him. And this is another one. Uh, we talk about how he comes up with ideas. We talk a little bit about, a little bit about everything. And 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 I, I, I'm very blessed to talk to him. I absolutely love him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, podcaster, comedian, man show, OG, Adam Carolla. Hey, Bert. Hey, Adam. How you doing, man? Good. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing really great, Adam. Good. I uh, This just in, uh, chief of Cherokee Nation asked Jeep to stop using its tribe's name on their cars. <laughs> Yes, it, it it's called a progressive movement, Bert. It does not stop. <laughs> I uh, we're rolling now. I got a. Uh, I have so much I want to talk to you about. I I have so much I want to talk to you about because you just opened my eyes the other day. The fact that the neighborhood I live in was until they realized they couldn't move properties here, and so they changed it to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe they did that with garbanzo beans. Maybe they're like, we can't move something called garbanzo beans. We'll call them chickpeas and we'll get some flow. Yeah. I grew up in, um, everyone, the houses, my, my dad's house, my mom's house, my grandparents' house. We all grew up right in the middle. And, and at a certain point it got really dicey. So the people who didn't want to be lumped in with the people who lived in the, I guess it would be the Northern or Eastern part of, you know, the sort of crowd. Uh, we didn't live there. We lived in another part and those people didn't want to be lumped in for, with those people. So they changed it to. Yeah. It's uh and by the way, it's, I don't know if you've seen what's going on with the homeless people here, but it's fucking chaos. What happened to your city, Adam? Well, you know, homelessness started out in, you know, Skid Row downtown, you know. Well, first off, it just it just was like Skid Row. And then now I don't know if they named it Skid Row first and homeless people who are on the skids were attracted to it like. I guess Hawaiian gardens probably tracks a lot of Hawaiians. I don't know. Or maybe it was called, you know, pear blossom and it just got changed to skid row because it got converted. But either way, uh, if it was called skid row in the forties, that's on the people who named it skid row, but it was on skid row. And then it kind of spread out to the, um, uh, downtown and then I was always like, hey, if you're going to be homeless, why don't you be down at the beach? And I guess uh, they heard me. So then they moved it over to Venice. <laughs> and for it, but, but the valley was always devoid of any homelessness. It, it didn't exist in the San Fernando Valley because it, it just never would have moved from downtown all the way over to the valley, you know, good 12, 13 miles away. But uh, now the valley has been been consumed. But again, if you're going to be homeless, why live on Skid Row? So if the average commercial building or residential building on Skid Row is worth 10 cents, why not go to Encino or why not go to Venice or why not go to Malibu? Like, why not? If you're going to the sidewalks the same, why don't you? Why don't you flop in front of a $12 million house versus flopping in front of a liquor store with bars on the windows? Yeah, there is more room out here. So I, I wonder if that they moved to the valley for the same reason I moved to the valley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I wonder if homeless people are going to start judging other homeless people like the, like we do, like the ones on the West side kind of look down their nose at the people who live in the Valley. I yeah. wonder if there's going to be the Santa Monica homeless that are like telling their kids not to play with the Reseda homeless people. <laughs> it's interesting. You have your, your kind of your voice is, is something I, I resonates with me because you have the same call out of hypocrisy that I have where I like, where you, you live around a bunch of people who are all the, I, I do at least about all these blowhard liberals who pretend and, and virtue signal online and tell you one thing after another. But then the second homeless people get near them, they're like, get them the fuck out of here. They're fucking animals. And you're like, what happened to your liberal values? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's no different in a weird way than like windmills that are put out in the ocean, which is fine. But the good folks at Martha's Vineyard do not want any of those windmills out on their veranda. So, you know, that always that's always going to exist. And the way to cure it is not to be so goddamn sanctimonious when it's going on in other places. Then we wouldn't call you a hypocrite when you cried like a stuck pig when it comes to your neighborhood yeah it seems and it seems like it seems like the sanctimonious sometimes are running everything and and then when people simply have a different difference of opinion it, it's they get fucking lambasted for it well it's this ad hominem stuff which is you cannot suggest things about homelessness or black lives matters or schools or unions or shutdowns or any or any of that stuff without you used to just be it used to be a contrarian's opinion or another opinion or another point of view now it's you hate homeless people or you hate black people or you hate school teachers like it's obviously it's an argument you make when you have a weak argument the the whole ad hominem stuff Oh yeah. I've, I've, it, it seems I've been accused of, I've been accused of horrible things just at dinner parties when you just are bringing up a different opinion and everyone's like, how dare you challenge my opinion? I haven't thought out the defense of my opinion, but I know that my opinion when tweeted out gets retweeted. So what the fuck, you know, I have uh, not only been the recipient of that at dinner parties, but also just at dinner, literally family members turning on me. Oh, I wait, wait, are you, are you being serious? Cause I definitely I have that issue. My daughters have corrected me in front of a meal that I, that I provided with the way I think, like I, I had, yeah. I, I go, you understand that the meal you're eating, your braces that are on your mouth that was paid for by my brain. Please don't try to stifle my brain. You're a child. All right. Not only did I pay for the pot roast, but I paid for the orthodontist that got the pot roast to stick to your front row of braces. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they don't know. Here's the whole thing, Bert. Money is now invisible, right? So there used to be a real direct connection between money and the person that earned the money, right? So you would come home, you know, many, many years ago, you'd come home with pelts, you know, after tracking vermin in the snow for, for three days. And when you laid those pelts down, somebody could do a real direct connection between who was spending the pelts and who was getting the pelts. Right. And then, and then at some point, you know, you'd get a job at a mill or something and you'd come home with a meagerly check and lay that down on the dining room table with, you know, black lung and coal dust all over your face. But it's now all direct deposit. Right. It's all you sit around, you bloviate into a microphone or you go up on stage with a beer and complain about your family. And then they invisibly pay you. And that's who paid for this pot roast. Yeah, but it's invisible. There is no direct connection anymore. Yeah, I got accused of not having a job. My daughters when right. my daughters told me, what do you do? And I went, right. are you being serious? And they're like, yeah, mom works. Mom runs our money. And I was like who do you think earns the money? And they're like, mom, I go doing what? And they're like, well, what do you do? You just go off and party with your friends. And I was like, oh no, I'm doing, I'm on tour. I'm, I'm on tour. Do you think Motley Crue doesn't do anything? 
fucking and you're right i think it's the invisibility of money of money or the fact that they can take their phone run it in front of the starbucks and and it's paid for as opposed to your dad going all right you're going out tonight how much do you need and then you had to right. ask yeah god forbid you say you pay for anything in my house you pay for everything in my house i get lit up oh yeah oh yeah though no, that's that's what it is so when dad had the uh, sparklets bottle filled with quarters you know, next to the, next to the Barker lounger, he smoked in, they'd have to like get the quarters out and you'd have to count them out. And they had a little heft to them and they were tangible. And then you'd give it to your kid to go to the corner and get some candy or something. And there was that direct connection. Now they swipe the phone, dad pays. It's exactly the same from the dad standpoint. It's just the tangibility of it has been removed. Yeah. It's that's, I feel like it's a lack of humility. Like I feel, I feel like sometimes I don't really talk on a, any real political issues or anything like that because I never, I, I'm, I, I always come from a place of not knowing what the fuck I'm talking about. Like I, I saw the tweet you had about uh, the teachers' things, and I was like, and I, I have opinions on both sides where I go, yeah, well, get my fucking kids out of the house. Like I think this is unhealthy for them. And then I'm like, wait, I don't know any of this shit. Wait, why aren't, why aren't my kids back in school? And then I feel like a moron. Well, why aren't my kids in school? Well, I don't know anything either, but I've heard enough of like schools are reopen around the world and some never closed and schools are open all over the place in the United States. And the CDC says it's more dangerous at home than it is in a, in a classroom. So once you hear enough about that stuff, you kind of realize, yeah, maybe we should. I mean, you know, you think about this argument uh, first things first, the whole notion, at least in California, that we closed everything down outdoors. Like we arrested a guy who was paddle boarding alone in the ocean. We're bulldozing uh, this, making these big sand mounds for the beach volleyball courts to be closed down. They're, you know, welding pipe over the rims so the kids can't play basketball in the park. Like, so just the whole notion of closing down outdoor everything, including dining for a while and zero statistics about it being transmitted outdoors already out of the gate shows. We don't know what the fuck we're doing. Right. Or we do know what we're doing, but we're lying about it. So then we figure out that the greatest transmission as it is at home. Like I've talked to Dr. Drew about this, he said, everyone is getting it, it's getting it at home. And then we figured out that the families that have a lot of family members and generational family members living with them, they're the highest risk. And those are the kids that have been cooped up for the last year in their small apartments with Nana. So going to the classroom would statistically be much safer than staying back at the apartment. And now we do know all that. And yet we're still closed. It seems like the you know, when, when it was like, don't, don't wear a mask. And you were like, wait, why wouldn't you wear a mask? And then like, oh, no, no, you got to wear two. And you're like, oh, well, it, it's interesting. <laughs> why, like, why, why are you staying in LA? Cause you, you don't seem like someone who you seem like Rogan feels, I think probably the same way you feel about, you should be living a life. You should be out there. Your liberties should be respected. I, I don't want to speak for Joe at all, but I know for a fact he did move to Texas because he didn't like the way that this this state was being run. And you seem like someone who has been fairly vocal about Gavin Newsom and, and, and I, I'm guessing, I don't even know what Gavin Newsom's points are, but, but what, what have you thought about leaving? Yeah, I, I think everybody in LA who can't afford to leave is probably danced with the notion of leaving. Um, I have a couple of 14 year old twins who, I say just entered high school, but they never entered their high school. Uh, that's going on at home. But, you know, I would, for me, I would wait for them to get out of high school and then I can go wherever I want. Yeah. I, my, when Joe started leaving, it's Tom Segura and I do a podcast together and he, Tom was leaving and I was, he's like, you should move. And I was like, Mike, I got to junior and a freshman now they my freshman has not gone to school yet but uh i was like i can't leave i gotta wait 
And so now I'm here for four more years. Breaking news. This is an important PSA brought to you. A guy who just chopped up his balls. That's right. I chopped up my balls because I'm in Serbia and I didn't bring my manscape like a jackass. And I took my liners to my junk because my shit was getting tied up in jeans. And boy, I fucking wish I had the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, which is now available for purchase in the USA and Canada. I don't think it's still Serbia. I don't know. The new trimmer was just released only moments ago, and we're here to get your help you get your hands on it and share the news. Join the over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping. Go to manscaped.com and use the code BERT. I'm telling you, I absolutely love Manscaped. The new 4.0 is amazing, and I am blown away by the performance. The craftsmanship, the details on the 4.0 are next level. By the way, they're not just next level for your balls. I will say that. They are next level for every part of your body that has hair. Their advanced ceramic blade and skin-safe technology is so good that it almost seems as Manscaped worked with Elon Musk engineers to ensure your testicles are just as safe as possible. What makes this trimmer different? I'll tell you. New multifunction on and off switch that can engage a travel lock for people who like to travel so you're not just vibrating in your bag. The lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn off the 4,000K LED spotlight on and off whenever you need for more precision shave. The new trimmer even allows you to customize your trims for all over through additional guard lengths with sizes one through four. And looks wise, it's sleek, two-tone matte and gloss finish. Even features a hot foil stamp, black chrome Manscaped logo that shows off the mower. I'm telling you, get 20% off of free worldwide shipping by going to manscaped.com and use the promo code BERT. That's 20% off of free shipping worldwide by going to manscaped.com and use the code BERT. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tool for the job with Manscaped. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid IV. Listen, I like to go hard at night. I'm going hard right now. The thing that cures it for me, two simple things, hydration and working out. I can't work out if I'm not hydrated. And I'm telling you right now, with one stick of liquid IV and 16 ounces of water, you get two to three times the amount of hydration as plain water. I'm telling you, I feel healthier. I think, I think I'm pretty sure I feel the health benefits almost immediately. They've got lemon, lime, acacia berry, passion fruit, guava, watermelon, apple pie, or strawberry. I'm addicted to lemon, lime. I really am. It contains five essential vitamins, more vitamin C than an orange, and as much potassium and as a banana. It's healthier than those sugary sports drinks, no artificial flavors or preservatives, less sugar than an apple. It's made with clean ingredients. And I'll tell you what makes it so effective, cellular transport technology. That's the optimal ratio of glucose to sodium to pa- and potassium delivers water and nutrients into the bloodstream. Liquid IV, it's called liquid IV for a reason. One stick of liquid IV into 16 ounces of water. It's like, it's like drinking three bottles or two to three bottles of water. The company is also donating 4 million servings in response to COVID-19. Products are being donated to hospitals, first responders, food banks, veterans, and active military. They've donated over 10 million servings globally. Glad, grab your liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code BERT at checkout. That's 25% off your order when you get better hydration today using the promo code BERT at liquidiv.com. How often, how much do you think about a subject before you talk about it? Hmm. Do you chew on thoughts and ruminate on them? It's a good question. It's kind of hard to quantify. Um, I have these thoughts that start to kind of coalesce and then I, I usually think about them for a little bit. And then I ask other people, like I'll ask Dr. Drew or Mark Garrigus or people I know or people I respect. And I'll go, what do you think about this? And then I, I'll do, um, so I'll give you the exact process I, I went through and I'm in the midst of uh, as we speak. And I just had the conversation with my producer. So I thought I was uh, sitting around last night watching Starsky and Hutch. And I thought, uh, I thought, huh, I, I remember hearing some story about Paul Michael Glazer, who is uh, Starsky. 
which is always confusing to me because David Soul is the blonde guy. And the blonde guy is normally the Polish guy. And you think the blonde guy would be Starsky and the guy with the black hair would be Hutch. But Starsky is, in fact, the, the dark haired guy. So David Soul, uh, sorry, Paul Michael Glazer, uh, Starsky. I remember thinking, I remember hearing some story about his wife, Elizabeth Glazer, contracting AIDS through like a blood transfusion. And uh, then like their one kid got it, infant got it through birth, through breastfeeding, and the other got it like in utero. And so I did a little dive on it. Like, oh yeah, that's right. That's what happened. She died of AIDS early on. Got it in like 81. And then I'm now I'm thinking about AIDS. Like, yeah, AIDS. Man, yeah, I remember that. I remember living through that. And then I remember how it devastated Africa. And I remember going, yeah, man, Africa. That was a big deal. We're having all these benefits and we're trying to save Africa from AIDS. And then I thought, wow, that was like a pandemic from, you know, 25 years, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I started thinking about that. And then I went, wait a minute, I've not heard anything about Africa and COVID-19. Why, why no Africa talk? Like we're getting a lot of Europe talk. We're getting a lot of in Germany and in Spain and in France. And I started just thinking about like all the news has been about, um, has been about the United States. And then we'd go in Europe blah, 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 or Sweden never shut down. Lots of Sweden stories, lots of Germany stories. And I thought, not heard any Africa stories. And I thought, well, that's weird because we're do a lot of stories about poor black people being devastated, but Africa has got a lot of poor black people. Why no CNN stories on Africa? So I started thinking, well, A, must not be bad news because if it was bad news, we'd definitely be hearing about it, but zero news about the continent of Africa, which is pretty crazy considering how big it is and how we're sort of obsessed here with Africa in general, like what's going on over there vis-a-vis AIDS or whatever pandemic, Ebola or whatever, whatever's going on. So I thought, hmm, what is this? Like, so this is how my process is working like earlier in the day. So I thought to myself, well, I know they're on hydroxychloroquine for malaria over there. And it's like, it's over the counter and a lot of people are on it. So I thought, well, maybe they're not getting it because of the hydroxychloroquine. I was like, hmm, but then why wouldn't that be reported? And then I thought, oh, because we don't like hydroxychloroquine in this country because Trump said it may be helpful. And so the news turned on hydroxychloroquine. So maybe that is why we're not hearing about it. But I thought I should find out like what the population of Africa is and other things before I start saying this into a microphone. So uh, I told my producer, find these things out. And there's a lot of things going on in Africa. One is, is the average age of a person in Africa, I think it's like 19. So they're very young. And then I thought, well, that's interesting. But then I also thought it kind of dovetails with my conspiracy theory, which is we have been leaving ages out. Like this doesn't really affect young people like it affects old people. And that's been something that's been missing from our news coverage for a long time. So maybe it's the fact. So once you say Africa's not being devastated, then the next question is, is why not? And the why not may lead to answers that our news doesn't like or hasn't been sharing with us. So uh, I say to him, you know, find out the population, see if you can find out what percentage is on hydroxychloroquine, um, average age, all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of the process because I want to know, like my thing isn't, I have a hair, hairbrained crackpot theory and I'm running with it. My thing is, is before I run with it, 
I'd like to know some more. I'd like some more data that I haven't thought about. And something like average age, I would never think of it. But if you had one country where the average age was 19 and the other country where the average age was 41, then you'd have a different outcome as it pertained to this thing that affects older people and not younger people. That's insane. The average age is 19. That's yes. insane. I mean, I, I've, I've only seen videos of like what the beaches look like in Sierra Leone. I, 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 I did a, a I, I see that is why I shouldn't be speaking on anything fucking politicized because I don't do the research. I just have the hot take and run with it and try to defend it. Like a guy who threw a punch in a bar at someone who didn't know and then just says, oh, fuck it. I'll fight everyone until I get out of here. You know, right. You, you're full Conor McGregor. I'm full Conor uh, listen, McGregor. I spit out tons of shit that I don't research. Let's not uh, turn me into a uh, no, professor I, <laughs> here. Don't get me wrong. I talk about, I talk on my ass all the time, but I have theories and then I would, I guess I would kind of like to be, I wouldn't like to be, but I'd like to challenge myself to be defeated on these theories I have. So to me, it's a process. It's maybe my building background or something. Like I want to know how stuff works and I'm curious about all the stuff I'm not thinking of. Do you ever run these ideas by Jimmy anymore? No, I mean, but I never, I never ran ideas past Jimmy unless we were sitting in the man show office and I wanted to do a bit or, uh, you know, a man on the street or something like that. But uh, I never ran my podcast or radio like ideas past Jimmy. I guess when I did my morning radio show, he was a producer on it. We would have those, those discussions, but no, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. It's just, I come here every day, do a podcast. He'd be, he'd never sleep if I ran all my ideas past him. <laughs> I go back to those days when you guys, we're doing the man show uh, so much in my head, thinking of the cars you drove. Uh, just this, the silliest things where you put weight in it as an adult and you think, I go, God, I remember, I, I, I want to say that you guys had Mer Mercedes at the time. And uh, Jimmy had a Mercedes. Jimmy had a Mercedes. And I remember just thinking, like, you guys parked right outside my dressing room. And I remember thinking, God, can you imagine having a Mercedes? Like, what's yeah. that going to be like? Yeah. And then it happens and you're like, oh, that's that's not what I thought it would be. <laughs> no. No, even a Rolls Royce. I mean, there is no, you know, the good. I mean, so to me, the human condition is like, ask anyone that was blinded as an adult. You know, and you go, oh, my God, I would kill myself. Like, what would that be like to just lose your sight at the age of 34 or something like that? And at some point, they'll tell you, oh, it was devastating. And then at some point, they'll tell you it was a blessing because they were able to X, Y, and Z or whatever it is. So we have this crazy ability to adapt to almost everything. Um, and sort of normalize it. It's also what happens to nine-year-olds that are getting molested by their stepdad. Like it just becomes, well, this is my, this is my life. You know, and you go, how do you get up and go to school and live in the same house? Like that, it just, we have the ability to make everything normal. And, it, you know, if you go blind, you'll make it normal. And if you drive a Rolls Royce 15 minutes after you, get it off the dealer's lot, it'll just be normal. You'll be eating in and out burgers and fucking complaining that the thing doesn't have an ashtray and this is bullshit. And that's, that's what we do as humans. Yeah. I remember I got a, my first expensive car I bought was a Yukon Denali. Mm. And, uh, and I was so impressed with this car. I, I mean, it was more than I could afford, but it was nice. And I would park it uh, all the way in the corner of the parking lot. I didn't want anyone getting near it. And then one day you just, that isn't in your brain anymore. And you're parking it in the spot. It barely fits in dinging the door. Like, ah, fuck. When did, when did this lose its preciousness? You know? Yeah. 
I think it happens with marriage as well. (laughs) 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 Eh, Homeless guy had sex with my wife. What are you going to (laughs) do? What are you going to (laughs) do? The, um, yeah, the thing that's funny about that and how, how weird and relative everything is, is when I was growing up in the Valley and always just driving beater pickup trucks, you know, always had, I just had mini pickup trucks, Datsuns. And, um, I had to drive a truck because of my profession, because I was a carpenter. And these are like vinyl bench seats with no headrests and no air conditioning and no extra cab or anything. These were just beater mini pickup trucks. And that's what I drove. And at a certain point, I got into show business a little bit and it was time to like step up to like a real car. So a lot of people talk about driving around crappy cars and then transitioning into a better car. But I was driving around mini pickup trucks, which didn't even get to the level of crappy car. These were little shit boxes. You know, I never had a car with air conditioning. I lived in the Valley my entire life, you know, shit like that. So at a certain point, I went to like the Nissan dealer and I got like a Maxima that was like two years old, but it had like leather interior and it was an automatic and it had air conditioning. It was like a real car with a V6, you know? And I was like, finally I've arrived. Like I'm driving a real car. We did some event for Loveline on MTV or something. And it was at the Playboy Mansion. And I just came pulling up into the Playboy Mansion in my Nissan Maxima. And one of the producers from Loveline was like standing out front. And he was like, what are you driving that for? And I'm like, yeah, it's sweet, right? And he's like, (laughs) you should be driving a BMW or a Lexus or something. And so the car that was meant I'd arrived in my mind to this guy was like, what the fuck are you slumming it with a Nissan for? And that's when I realized, oh, that's just, that's just how we work. Oh, oh yeah. People, when they come to my house, the house I live in right now, the first thing they say is, God, it's so small. And I go, "Uh, thanks. And they're like, no, I just thought you'd have like a big house. And I was like, and, and it's, it's funny because we're, we're building a house right now. And, uh, and I'm, and it's, I'm uncomfortable with how big it is. I just, it, there's, I'm, for whatever reason, I, I, I feel emotionally more comfortable in a house where people go, I thought you'd have a bigger house. Cause in, in essence, I think that means that I'm saving my money or at least they go, they're curious. I remember seeing Kevin James, Kevin James, oddly enough, had a Jeep Cherokee, like a, a beater Cherokee and lived in an apartment when he was on King of Queens. And I remember going, I remember saying to his brother, Gary, like, why does he have that car? And he was like, it's, it's his car. It's what we moved out here in. And I was like, yeah, but he could afford anything. And he's like, yeah, he, Kevin doesn't spend a lot of money like that. And I was like, fuck. I was like, I have a Denali. Jesus Christ. And so I'm having a hard time because I part of, part of me starts going, what do you need? Like what, how big does a house need to be? You know? Well, you know, the answer is it, it that should move. I mean, that should be fluid are kind of elastic in your life. You know, the Nissan Maxima that I was over the moon about, I'm, I wouldn't be as excited about driving today, but it, it's not necessarily directly connected to money. You know, part of it is just, I'll give you an example. Let's say a kitchen. You know, when I was growing up, kitchens were kitchens. There were little There's nothing going on. Nobody congregated in a kitchen. There was no islands. There's, you know, it's just a little shit boxy kitchens. You went in there to cook and then you left with your food. And now like, hey, it's nice having an island. It's nice having a uh, bar stools. And it's nice being able to talk to your kids and make them scrambled eggs and then serve it up on the bar stool. And yeah, those kitchens cost more money, but do you like it? And is it just connected to money? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the pasta water filler above the sink, above the, above Oh the, yeah. The that's like something pot. Yeah. Dude, I, ice makers. I, I'm like, I'm going oh. nuts on ice makers. I, I love good ice. 
Yeah. No, it's so true. Yeah. The stupid stuff that you go, well, does anyone really need that? And the answer is, well, no, no one really needs 96% of what we, what we have. But then you get into these weird zones. Like I never understood, like the really nice houses, they have the towel bar. That's the towel warmer. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ever getting there. Like yeah. I can step out of a hot shower and uh, get one of those uh, Giza dream towels from the My Pillow guy, and I think I'll be fine with that. We don't need it pre-warmed for my body. Yeah, I I I was the same way because I grew up in Florida. I was the same way about hearing about heated tiles, and I was like, "What the fuck? Why would you ever heat a tile?" I remember on cribs they could be like, "And these tiles are heated," and I was like, "That's crazy." And then we were in Big Bear staying in a place and I got out of the shower and I stepped on heated tiles. I was like, this is fucking nice. (laughs) Yes. I feel the same way with the heat in the seats of the car. Oh, I love, I turn on the heat in the seat every time I get, and by the way, I love the air conditioning in the seat. I love it all in the seat. I'm with you. And I hate the people you ever do this move where like someone gets in the car. Some people have this weird relationship with the heat in the seat. Like sometimes on a cold day, I'll just reach over and turn it on for the passenger because they don't know how the car works and they get offended sometimes. Like, I, <laughs> I don't like that. Like, my seat? <laughs> I, I might fall asleep and shit myself. Wow. Okay, your highness. What the fuck is there not to like about a warm bum? <laughs> Exactly. It loosens up your hammies. I mean, I, right. I, I do it before a workout. I get in my car and sit in the chair. My daughters will turn their turn it on. And all of a sudden you'll realize it's on and you can just see them smiling to themselves as if like they got gotcha. you. The, the, the real key is when you start dialing in all your zones where it's like, well, it's cold outside. So I'm going to put some heat in the seat but I'll just put it at two. But if I open the sunroof, I'll get a little cold air coming in. So I'll turn it up to three and then I'll take the temperature in the car and I'll bump that up a little so they can kind of fight. The elements can duke it out in the cabin of the Denali. Right. But I love, I love that feeling of like heat coming off the seat, cold outside window down, cold air in the face, hot air in the anus. I love that. I, I just, I swear to God, I just said that to my wife and daughters the other day. It's windy. It's cold. And I said, you know, when I was a kid, my dad said his favorite thing this is before he seat eaters, heat seat eaters was to crank the heat up in the car, but roll the windows down. You have the fresh air, yeah. but you're warm. And I was like, and right. I did it. And because all my, everyone in my house has long hair. It just was annoying to them. And I was like, this fucking, this is why you want to have boys. This podcast is brought to you by Noom. I was just having a conversation in hair and makeup about Noom with my lead, co-lead Stephanie, and she was saying, does it work? And I said, you know what's great about Noom? What I found great is there's a lot of information out there, like old school information, and Noom helps kind of uh, set those questionable things right. It gives you food advice that you're looking for, and be honest, I got to be honest with you, just tracking my calories in general is amazing for me. I- I'm trying to eat better and feel better and understand my cravings, which is so perfect for me. My cravings go fucking nuts, especially when you're in a set of a movie. And when you have Noom, your accountability for those cravings kind of, it's, it's, I'll tell you right now, I'll tell you the one benefit I have is I fit better in my clothes. Noom's com- cognitive behavioral approach means you're not just losing weight, you're building the healthy habits to keep it off also. Noom is forgiving because you are human. If you go off track today, you'll get back on track tomorrow. And everyone's busy. That's why Noom doesn't demand that much of the time. Literally, all they're asking for is 10 minutes out of the day. Over 80% of Noom, Noomers, finish the program. And over 60% have stuck with their goals for at least one year. There's science to getting healthier. It's called Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash birdcast. Learn how to eat again with Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash birdcast. Ready to learn how to live healthier? Sign up for Noom today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash BirdCast. BirdCast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. In May, Mental Health Awareness Month, and throughout June, BirdCast is proud to join the cause of destigmatization of therapy. Man, June, 
is when that happens, listen, I've been in therapy forever. It's helped so much. If you're not in therapy, look, for me personally, I don't want to get in a car. I don't want to have to drive someone's office. I start resenting them. I'd rather just do it at home in my pajamas or on the treadmill. I do it on the treadmill a lot. If you're struggling with having difficulty sleeping or difficulty meeting your goals, or you're just feeling anxious or stressed like Bert Kreischer, BetterHelp counselors can help listen and help. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional. You can start communicating with them in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not a self-help line. It's professional counseling done securely online. Therapists have a broad range of expertise that may not be available in your local area. The service is available for clients worldwide. Log into your account anytime. Send a message to your counselor whenever you can schedule weekly video, phone, or even live chat sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. So they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That is so fucking important. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp, but they're recruiting, adi- uh, recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com slash BERT. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash BERT. So are your twins one of each? Yeah. Yeah, boy, girl, I'm having uh, I'm having issues with how to raise a daughter, uh, meaning certain values I was I, that I hang my hat on about never quitting anything. It's the only reason I'm successful. Making yourself a little uncomfortable, pushing yourself beyond what you believe your talents are to find your talents. Sometimes I find those to be very male uh, uh, f- things you would have said to a boy. You know, never quit. Yeah, it's it's now kind of stuff you can't even say to a boy, like we've just decided all that stuff with some sort of passe, something like all that, all the shit your pop Warner football coach ever said to you. I mean, I just learned everything from playing peewee football. That's Uh, everything. Every one of my life lessons was derived from sports. Me too. 100%. And those guys, they didn't sugarcoat anything. There were these you know, gruff guys with the windbreakers and the beards and they had dip, you know, in their cheek. And they would, they would call, I mean, they would all be, uh, incarcerated now for how they treated nine-year-old kids. But, uh, I liked it and I never, I never thought, I never mistook it for anything other than they just want us to be better so we can. Yeah. It's, it's uh, the way that lessons were taught to me were uncomfortable i remember uh two coaches betting each other steak dinners that first one that could hit a ground ball past me at third base i was uh 10 years old and they the i have grown men taking full cuts at, a, at a, in a mine in a little league st- sized field full cuts and here i am terrified going fuck but no one got it past me. And I remember it being like, I don't know why I got in the car. I told my dad about it. My dad's like, those better fucking lunatics. <laughs> yeah. But you learned or you, you got something out of it. Yeah. I could remember when I was, um, I played seven years of pop Warner. So I played a lot. I started when I was seven and I remember we had this, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, who was like the line coach. He was like, on Friday practice, you know, back when we were nine or 10, it's like on Friday's practice, if you think there's a guy starting in front of you that shouldn't be starting in front of you, then you just challenge him. And we got this line and you guys just line it up and we go for it. And we just see which kid whips the other kid's ass. Because back then, you know, you're nine, you're 10 years old, you're playing defensive tackle. The, the, you know, there's not a lot of scheming going on. It's just pretty much, can you handle the dude in front of you? And if you could, well, then we'll put that guy in the game, you know? So I always started. So it was always kind of like, all right, who's who's going to who's gonna step up to the line on Friday? And as I recall, it probably happened a couple times. But once they figured out it wasn't, you know, didn't work or the person was starting because they should have been starting, it stopped. But that was his thing. Like if, and and if anybody, if any kids got into a spat or a scrap or an argument, he just grabbed both their face mask, you know, that move. And then he'd get them down on the line and he'd go, you go at it. You know, you settle it on the field and all that shit. And, uh, 
you know, it, there were times when it was a little intimidating or scary or something like that, but it's also, Hey, this is what you do. Like, this is football. This is how, how you do it. I was driving my daughter. My daughter had a freshman orientation meetup where it was socially distant at her school and she was melting down, like melting down. Didn't want to do it. Wasn't going to like anyone. No one's going to like her. They already know each other, all this stuff. And I said, listen, it's not going to be as bad as my first day. I said, I went to an all boys Catholic high school. First period was PE. And I thought I'm an athlete. I don't know anyone there, but I'm going to, as soon as we start playing sports, I'll, I'm going to, that's how you, that's how I'll make friends. Everyone be like, oh, you're fucking good. Let's play. And I was like, I was like, I love these kids. We're all Cuban with mustaches dunking. And I'm like, fuck, I'm not even good at sports. And then after PE, we go into the locker room and coach says, everyone in the showers. And I see 18, 17, 16, 15 year olds. I'm 14, all naked and very comfortable being naked. Pubic hair everywhere. And I'm terrified. I said, what I didn't know is all the boys in my class were all terrified also. I didn't know that. So I'm so wrapped up in my own head. And that's what you need to know is you're going to be wrapped up in your own head. All the other kids are nervous too. And then she goes, well, what happened? Did you get in the shower? I said, well, yeah, we were all stalling. And then coach, I won't say his name, but I want to so bad. Coach comes out, looks at us, sees that no one's getting undressed, pulls my pants down and goes, that's Chrysler's cock. You've all got one. Now get in the fucking showers. <laughs> and I just, and then by the way, that's a, a fond memory I have of Jesuit high school. And my daughter is like frozen going, Oh, there's no way it's going to be that bad. And I go, oh, yeah, that's back when you could assault children. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know. So you and I, we're no worse for wear. I mean, we learned everything we needed to learn from that experience. And then you obviously apply it to your modern day life and comedy and all the things you have to kind of summon in yourself because you got those super valuable lessons laid out to you early on. And then when you lose your morning show from clear channel, you decide I'm going to challenge the biggest kid in the park and you start a podcast network. And then you do that. And then you look at all of us that kind of followed in your, in your trails of going, well, fuck it's, it's, I think it's what makes great men is that adversity because the, the path you've set out for your own self, we've all mimicked and now we're all making a living on on kind of on the pop warner life lessons you were taught oh thanks that's nice to say you have um, to notice that all of us are just taking your business model and doing it also you were the I, first i well thanks i i don't notice that or i don't i don't think about it per se because it's a smart not in my wiring but i do appreciate you saying it um yeah i was like I learned a, a valuable lesson when I was in high school via sports, which is I was like in the, it was a delayed gratification message. I was on the B team in the 10th grade and um, I didn't even start on the B team. And I was like, Ugh, if you're not starting on the B team, what are the chances you're going to varsity? at all or getting any playing time or whatever. And then the coach said, uh, play another year on the B team and then you'll start on the B team. And I was like, well, then I'll be in the 11th grade starting on the B team. And then I'll go to my senior year on the varsity. And what are the chances I'll start? Uh, I think there'd be a better chance if I just started lifting weights and eating hard boiled eggs going to the varsity in the 11th grade and just sitting on the bench again. And then my senior year, I could start on the varsity because I already would have been on the varsity. I know the coaches and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, instead of starting on the B team, I'll just take another year of sitting on the bench. Football practice sucks. So hot in the San Fernando Valley, blah, blah, blah. And then when you don't start in the game, it's like, it's lose, lose. It's like all the wind sprints and all the drills and all the heat and all the shit from during the week. And then Friday night rolls around, you sit on the bench, you know? So um, I was like, but I, I'm willing to do that. And then I went to, the, so I went to the varsity my junior year and a guy in front of me ended up getting injured and I ended up starting the whole year on varsity and then my senior year just was already 
you know, a done deal. I'd already started the year before on varsity, but it's because I made that decision of saying, I will sit on the bench for two whole years uh, in a three year high school career. I'll sit on the bench, two of them that got me to that position. And then later on, I was like, all right, so you have a plan, you're willing to delay gratification and you're willing to work hard. I think something good will come out of it. And I just took that everywhere it went. Yeah. Yeah. I, I swear to God out of my head, the exact same conversation, except it was JV baseball versus varsity baseball. Same thing happened. Guy in left field blew out his knee playing football. And I started my, for three years, I think for three years in varsity because I, I, and it, because I was willing to take a step backwards and, and have a plan. And I just explained this to my daughters and then they just quit softball. They just fucking quit. <laughs> quit and said let's t- we're gonna take up golf and i was like oh, well, at least maybe we can hang out and play golf when you're older there is no more imparting wisdom <laughs> i've realized there is you cannot impart wisdom anymore it just literally doesn't exist and it trying just- to parent when you've lived your life like a fucking john daly and party your entire life away trying to lean in and go listen here are the rules no booze no weed and they're like wait when did you start smoking weed doesn't matter Wait, well, how old were you? 14. I'm 16. I haven't done it. Why can't I do it? Okay. Oh, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You, there, There's no way. You you have to, you know, do as I do as I say, not as I do, especially when you think about all the checkered past we've had. And then especially in a business where if you are an accountant or you work for IBM, you probably did the same thing we did when you were 14, but it's not in a book. It's not in a stand-up special. It's not documented, you know? So what we're fighting against is at least the guy who works at Costco can tell his teenage kids not to smoke pot. And there's not a lot of documentation of him smoking pot when he was their age. Uh, For me, there's plenty of documentation of me doing everything nobody should do. One of my favorite clips is you guys getting high with Snoop Dogg in on the man show. Fucking there you go. Look no further than us getting high with Snoop Dogg. Well, I'll say to my kids, look, you can get high all you want as long as it's with Snoop Dogg or the equivalent or your equivalent of Snoop Dogg. You know, if you can, you want to blow doobie with Kanye West, so be it. <laughs> I said to Burr, I was talking to Burr about it. I said, you know, my daughter's been, how, how he goes, how's she doing with socially distant? I said, she's doing these bike rides. Her and her friends are doing like bike rides together at sunset, which is kind of nice. They're socially distant. They wear masks and Burr just slides in and smoking weed. And I was like, no. And he goes, oh yeah. He's like, would you? And I was like, well, of course. He's like, hey, but can we ask this? Who are these people who have to weave that shit in? Like, you know, like you get, you know, you build a guest house in the back of your room. You know what I mean? And the back of your property, you got a guest house in the back of the property. And like, you're showing one of your friends and you're like, it's got its own bathroom, Wi-Fi. It's got a tub. It's a nice little apartment space. And they go, yeah, yeah. Your daughter's going to be blowing her boyfriend in this thing in four months. And you're like, why? I, okay, that's true. I'm sure it's all true. But why? Who anointed you the fucking one to bring that up? <laughs> is there is there no etiquette at all? You know what I mean? Like every time you do that, like I got a, I got a condo in Malibu. Okay, you know who's going to be hanging out there in high school with their boyfriend? Like I, first off, I understand how life works. Yeah. Why not just compliment me on the cabinetry and we'll get the fuck on with this? Why? Why these tidings? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, I definitely know it. I have, I'm have. i filled with those friends. Do you parent that? Do you find yourself parent your son in different, your daughter totally different? No, I, I just kind of go with, you know, what do you want to do or here's life or whatever. Probably. Truthfully, I probably have a few more of those conversations with my son where it's like, listen, I don't care about school and I don't care about homework, but you better fucking learn how to work. 
I don't, I'm not interested in scholastics or GPA. I, I don't, and by the way, I'd be a hypocrite if I what if I said I did, but so you may be a shitty student or you may be behind on your homework and all that shit, but you better fucking learn to work. You better learn to work. And I don't have those with my daughter, A, because she's a little better at it. But then B, I realize it's a sort of male centric, like I'm still old school. Like, hey, dude, you're going to be taking care of a family one day and video games ain't going to pay the bills. Yeah, that's interesting. Raising a kid who who's been born into a, 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 a more privileged life than you were born into. I mean, I know, I know intimately, I know where you grew up and how you grew up and it was, it was tough. It was a lot tougher than what your son may have to experience. So the lessons that you had to learn by yourself, I remember you t- explaining how you'd get to school in the morning was just run across the street, jump in the fence. I don't know if my kids have that in their DNA, you know? Oh Yeah. They'd be standing at the fence going, help. (laughs) Right. All right. My son would go to the fence and go, I don't get it why all you can't just climb the fence and be on my side. Then we'd have school here. (laughs) My daughter would probably expect everyone should just climb over and get over to her side, thus creating the school on her side of the fence. So, uh, no. I uh, And, you know, how, how could you impart that because sort of like being on an island and saying, hey, look at me. I'm not fat. I just ate fresh fish and coconuts every day. And it's like, yeah, but they're at a golden corral. And you're sort of telling them, stay away from the popcorn shrimp and stay away from the ambrosia salad. And it's like, well, look, you didn't have a choice. That's why you are this way. You had nothing. You had a choice. What if you had a whole bunch of choices. Would you have turned out this way? And the answer is probably not. You know, I would have given in to whatever they give into on a daily basis. Yeah. I I give into it on a daily basis today. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I do not practice what I preach. I'll tell you what, Adam, I know you got to get going. You've got a busy day. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me at all. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan. I, I, like I said, all of us owe you a debt of gratitude for the way you decided to transition your business and kind of open the lane for all of us. So, so it's an honor getting to talk to you at all, brother. Thanks, Bert. We'll have you on my pod super soon whenever you can. Yeah, I'd love to, man. I would absolutely love to. I'll ta- uh, talk to you later, man. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Take care. 